I think there was one live where I heard you say one of your initial classes, one of the first classes you had, or earlier classes you had, you noticed that it was predominantly non-black women who were going in there studying black men. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mentioned that on a, a panel with Obsidian and Kevin Samuels. Okay. 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 Ago, and I didn't know where that was going to go. Next thing I know, people were calling me because Kevin was saying it on uh, some other show. <laughs> but that, that, that went through stages. So I've been teaching now for about 24 years. And uh, I came to Fresno State about 14 years ago. And I started to teach, I started teaching a black male course because uh, it was needed. You know, I'm looking at these young brothers who were getting accepted and a lot of them were, you know, dropping out. A lot of them really didn't have any support structure on how to navigate college. They were having, you know, even the conversations I was listening to in the hallways, I was like, okay, if I don't get, you know, if I don't grab some of these young men, they're not, not only going to be out of here, they might even be arbitrarily locked up behind things. Um, mm -hmm. them don't understand. So I, I created these, this class alongside a student group for black males and uh, began to implement that. And early on, what I found was I had more black women than men, which, you know, numerically is no surprise. That tends to be the case anyway, as far as the enrollment in school. But it, it re I started to get fewer and fewer men and more and more women because my initial training in my doctorate was uh, as a feminist. I hadn't dealt with gender prior to my doctorate. So, I, you know, one of my uh, primary uh, mentors was a uh, ex Black Panther. She was a feminist. And so I came in with that framework. The only way I knew how to deal with gender was through kind of what she taught me. So I'm teaching this black male class using this approach I got in grad school. And I'm watching the numbers of black males dwindle. I'm seeing the black males in my class looking at the ground, just kind of disconnected. And I'm seeing the women more and more excited. And what I realized, what I realized was that it was becoming a class where the, the, the young ladies were using me to finger wag at the men on the campus to kind of nudge them to do what they wanted them to do. So when I started to actually ask the men what their perspectives were, and I started to kind of change the narrative, it, it was a learning process for me as well as for them. And after a couple of years, I noticed um, the women stopped coming. The number of black women dropped dramatically. The number of black males started to increase. And then after that, a couple of, within the next couple of years after that, I noticed I started to get this population of white white women. Yeah. I didn't know why they were there. You know, I didn't know why they were there. And when I began to kind of ask them, you know, in the hallways under the, you know, why, are you, you know, why are you taking this class? You had to be careful how you do it. Um, and I started to find, oh, oh, well, my boyfriend is black and I want to understand him and his family. Or, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to date some of the men on the basketball team or football team or whatever, whatever. But I don't understand them. So they, so they were doing research. They're getting A's. Yeah. <laughs> very smart. Very smart. It's a weird thing where I got to give A pluses to white women in a class on black males because they are handling all the homework assignments and reading everything to a T. They're asking me about the citations <laughs> that were made by the author. I'm like, good Lord. But they were serious. They were they were doing research and they were serious. about. And, and I would say, you know, another three or four years after that, I noticed the population shifted from, you know, white women to Latinas. And the Latinas were coming in with the same kind of intensity. Um, the same kind of questions, the same and the same motivation. They were dating black men. And this is this is Fresno. We're in Central California. So, mm, yeah. Uh, no. Black and Latino relationships here are, are not a strange thing by any measure. So, yeah. Well, and, and again, go back to your early, like, because I said, this is kind of what this conversation was born out of. This whole topic of grabbing your passport and SYSVMs yeah. and the controversy behind that. And it's like, you're literally telling me that you had a class that was dedicated to black men where black women have an opportunity to study their men, understand what they're going through, understand how to relate to them better. And instead of us doing that, you have other women of other ethnic groups, other races going in, taking notes, using it as ammo to get the quote unquote best men out there. Yeah. So it's like, how can you compete with that? This is this is based upon what you just said. It's like this is why they are winning our men. If if that is such a big complaint, this is mm -hmm. why these other women, white women, Latinas, Asians, this is why they are winning or stealing, however you want to put it, our men, because mm -hmm. they're actually interested in their in their interest. Like I said, it goes back to 
you know, when I asked you a few minutes ago, I was like, why are black men asking for so little? And then you go in to say, well, they're kind of used to that. They're socialized for that. You know, there's all this kind of, there's all these complicated dynamics. And if you meet somebody who give, you're asking for breadcrumbs and they give you a sandwich, it's like, oh well, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. Well, what is this? You know? No, uh, Patrice O'Neill, my <laughs> one of my favorite comedians, he had a whole bit where he talked about the power of okay, like having women that actually say, okay, you know, can you give me a glass of water? Okay. And he was like, you know, it was mind blowing to hear a woman say, it. and as funny as it was, and I remember I would listen to Patrice and, and all the women in my family, because I'd wait till Thanksgiving. And then I'd sit there and listen to Patrice and, you know, the women would get more and more quiet, laugh less, less and less. And I would laugh more and more because he was tapping into something that I didn't know I was frustrated about. I didn't know I was curious about. And he was kind of gently raising these concerns. But one of the things he joked about in that moment was, you know, just what it feels like to have somebody that is, uh, you know, not only cooperative, but will happily so, you know, and, and just something as subtle as that, you know. And so, yeah, when you talk about the different groups of women that were coming to the class and they're involved in deep conversations in the classes about relationships, they're asking questions. You know, it it, it 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 was a whole different dynamic. You know. Um, now, do you do you think the concern was? Do you think that it was genuine, or do you think some of it? Because I, you know, I, I see some in the comments like, "Oh, they were kind of using it as ammo just for fetishization," but they don't see them as real men deserving of love or respect. I mean, did you see? Do you think you saw some of that woman using that as a way to try to manipulate better? Do you think you there know, was a genuine? Like I said, I've been teaching for 24 odd years and I can tell you uh, the 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 way they came to the discussions, the way they participated. Yeah, there was a, there was a lot of genuine, you know, kind of behavior, a lot of reflexivity. They're talking about their experiences. They're asking questions with a kind of genuine, um, you know, kind of sensibility about it. Um, I don't think any of it was was, you know, was really performed in that way. I think what what was what threw everybody was just that anybody was interested in even having the dialogue. You know what I mean? It wasn't it wasn't like they were coming to class looking for boyfriends in the class. You know, they were coming to class to learn about black men because of the black men they were already dealing with. So, you know, so it was a different kind of sensibility. And there was an earnestness to the dialogues that were happening that even black men weren't used to. And it was kind of a strange thing. It wasn't negative by any means, but it was it was different because when black women were the majority of the class, a lot of it was very argumentative. Uh, a lot of it was very uh, critical of black men. I mean, I remember there was one class very early on where this young man had come out the military. He's over six foot three. He's, you know, well developed muscularly. He's almost done with his degree. And he was a virgin. He was a Christian. He was a virgin. And yeah. you know, he mentioned that in class and the entire class of women went off on him and were trying to emasculate him at, in, at every turn. And I actually had to stop them because they weren't about to stop themselves. And it was just like, you know, why would you come to a, I mean, picture that. Picture a, black, a class on black women where the majority of the class are black men who come to talk about how horrible black women are. Like what, when would you see that actually happen? You know what they I mean? know, would it? <laughs> and then everybody's tearing into one woman because she hasn't had sex yet. You know what I mean? It, it's, it was that kind of dynamic, but the, the level of low key hostility, what Kevin used to call low boiling contempt was so palpable that um, when that shifted over in the next couple of years, it was a strange thing to notice. Like, so even if there were somehow, uh, you know, chameleons that were getting over on us or whatever, the level of hostility and you know, it was far less than what it had been. So, you know, um, it was strange. But I can tell you the class has been an interesting kind of lesson in racial dynamics because uh, yeah. white, white men made their appearance too. Um, and they made their appearance in the form of a military recruiter and a police dete a detective who came to arrest one of the students. So, wow. it, so if you look at it symbolically, you have white men, black women, and Hispanic and Latina women who have all made their presence felt. And the most hostile were black women and white men to the very idea of studying black men, right? The military recruiter wanted to take these men out of college and, and put them in the military. And of course the detective wanted to arrest somebody. The women, the black women wanted to denigrate the men in the class and finger wag. And then you had white women and Latinas who wanted to take notes and ask questions. So you tell me who's the most hostile out of that. 
you know, it's so sad to hear that because it's like, I get these, I hear these comments all the time in my page where, you know, it's essentially men are venting and they're like, you know, black women sold us out to white supremacy or, you know, black women, they're the biggest white supremacists. So, you know, essentially things on that line. And it's like, you know, I never want to, I'm never quick to just paint a broad stroke and to say, well, all black men are this or all black women are that. Cause I'm like, that's just simply not my experience. Right. Mm. But it's like at the same time, um, you know, what you mentioned, a class that was supposed to be about black male studies. And when you initially started the, the paradigm and, and what was so comfortable at that, at that moment for everybody was to essentially just blame black men. There was no, it didn't sound like it was comfortable or even expected to have a honest conversations about, Hey, maybe we're, you know, men str have struggled where they have been victimized and how that's impacted the family. Cause it's like, and a community community is made up of men and women. So mm -hmm. both bring stuff to the table. And I, I, I honestly am quite sick of the conversation that I've heard for a long time where it's like, it's just all black men's fault. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, there haven't been black men out there and there haven't been things that can be improved. You literally have channels of black men talking about the different issues that black men do to themselves. But it's like this cult, I think this culture of, again, you can't, you can't also go shine the light on women or you're being misandrist or you're being, mm -hmm. you know, everything other than the son of God. Like, it's just really not healthy. And, you know, again, going back to when I asked this simple question, how to support black men practically? And I was shocked and not shocked at the response and the behavior and it resonated with me so much. And I thought, even when I, you know, I'm thinking about this different conversation in the pick me space and the different, you know, female content creators that yeah. I love what they're doing and I love how we're having this conversation, but I'm thinking, I don't think any of us are really have been trained or taught or, or know what it means to lean in and say, okay, well, what are their interests? Cause we can talk about it. Like I said, the mm -hmm. last week or two, I've heard women talking about the best interests of, of black men, which I think is good. We should have the conversation, but how many, how many of us know how to listen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and not only listen, listen, not to argue. 